Okay, uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce um, Blaine Lawson from Stony Brook, who's going to talk about projective hulls, projective linking, and the relative Hodge question. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Tristan. I want to say it's a great honor and pleasure to be here in celebration of Masataki Kuranishi. He was someone who made life in mathematics wonderful and one of the people who made me glad to be a mathematician. Um, my talk is also going to be historical and um, mixed in with some conjectures. And um, I'm going to be talking about a, something which is um, something that I talked about in a conference that was given in, in celebration of uh, Nigel Hitchin some years back. And so um, you, he will probably enjoy this. Anyway, um, so I'm going to be talking about work, um, many people, but Reese Harvey and John Wormer in particular. Um, so, Right. So the first part is going to be polynomial hulls Warmer's theorem. So given a compact set in CN, the polynomial hull is simply the set of points in CN where the maximum principle is still obeyed. In other words, this is very fast. In other words, um, the set of points Z for which this inequality holds for all polynomials P, okay? Now, Wormer's theorem proved in 1958 was that if you have a, a, a compact connected embedded and real analytic curve in CN, then the polynomial hull of gamma is a one-dimensional complex analytic subvariety of the complement with finite area and, um, and the boundary of this variety is a set of components of, of gamma and there's actually complete boundary regularity. Now this was a bombshell at the time and it engendered a lot of work by a lot of um, very talented mathematicians. Um, Stoltenberg, Halsey Royd, and Eric Bishop, Herbert Alexander among them. And um, so it turns out that gamma does not need to be real analytic. It can be C infinity, it could be CK, it could in fact be a rectifiable curve. It, it is not necessary for gamma to be connected. It could have many components and so forth and so on. Um, and so it also is work, it was also related to some classical work of Israel Gelfand. Um, so if you consider a Banach algebra, which is of course a Banach space, uh, which is also an algebra satisfying this, satisfying this criterion, this, this inequality, then turns out that there exists a compact Hausdorff space K, I'll call it K sub A, and an embedding of A into the continuous functions on K sub A as a closed subalgebra under the soup norm. Okay, so this is a, a called a transformation, a Gelfand transformation. And um, so that so that this Banach algebra is actually the algebra of continuous functions on some compact space. Now <clears throat> The points of Ka turn out to be just multiplicative linear functionals and were the same thing as uh, maximal ideals. And so you can think of K sub A as the Gelfand spectrum of A. And of course, this very much preceded uh, Grothendieck's spectrum of a ring. And um, right there, one talks about prime ideals, not maximal ideals. So the prime ideals are sort of points of higher dimension. Right? Now, what I'm interested in is the following. Suppose you have a compact subset of CN 
then you can define an algebra on that com compact subset by taking the polynomials, restricting them to K and closing them up under the soup norm. And that gives you a, a Banach algebra. And it turns out that the Gelfand spectrum of that algebra isn't just K, it's the polynomial hull of K. I mean, it, it's naturally isomorphic to the polynomial hull of K. Okay, all right. So the enticing fact of all this was that when K is a curve, then there's analytic structure in, in the polynomial hull minus K, complex analytic structure. It was very unexpected at the time. Okay, now I want to make a, a brief aside, and that is that one of the big one of the big differences between complex analysis and one in several dimensions is the notion of a hull. Okay, and um, now you can you could when you want to define the hull the polynomial hull as I just did, you could have substituted for the polynomials the entire functions. And actually you could also uh, use the, uh, the, the pluri subharmonic functions defined globally. And you, you get the same, the same hull. Now, when you do it using pluri subharmonic functions, that's enticing because it turns out that using pluri subharmonic functions, you can, very, in a very natural way, extend the notion of hulls to calibrated geometries in Rn and actually to general nonlinear PDEs. And, um, and a lot of what one knows in, in, in first case carries over. Let me just give you an example. If you take the nonlinear differential equation, which is the real homogeneous Monge-Ampere equation, the determinant of the Hessian is zero, then the hulls that you get in Rn for a compact set are just the usual convex hull. And this leads to a potential theory that is essentially convex analysis. Okay, so now what I wanna to discuss today is something called the projective hulls. So I'm gonna start with a compact subset of complex projective space of dimension N. And then the projective hull is simply the set of points uh, in Pn for which there exists a constant C sub X bigger than or equal to one, such that this inequality is satisfied for all holomorphic sections of the deep power of the hyperplane bundle and for all of the so, so, so for every section of the dth power, you have this inequality, and if that holds for all d, then your point is in the projective hull. Now, this is independent of the choice of metric on a one that's straightforward to see. And if you don't like this particular, well, and there's another way of looking at this, if you like, if k is actually contained in Cn, which is construed to be Pn minus the hyperplane of infinity, then, um, then the points in the projective hull intersect with this Cn are points for which there exists, again, a constant C depending on X, such that, such that, this moves too fast for me. Ah, there it is, such that this inequality holds for all polynomials of degree less than or equal to D and all D bigger than zero. Okay, now there's some features of this. One, if K is equal to the boundary of a complex analytic subvariety, the boundary, of course, um, then that variety is contained in the projective hull. If K on the other hand is contained in an algebraic subvariety of Pn, then the projective hull is also contained in that variety. And what that means is that the projective hull is contained in the so-called Zariski hull 
of the set. That's the intersection of all algebraic varieties that contain the set, okay? It also sort of indicates, and it's true, that you should be able to find the projective hull um, intrinsically in terms of intrinsically on, on this hyper on, on this variety Z. And that and that in fact is true. You just need the variety Z and the restriction of O of one to the to the variety. Okay. Another thing is that if you have a real smooth hypersurface, it, no, if K is actually a smooth hypersurface and an irreducible algebraic variety, then the projective hole is just the variety itself. And if K is contained in an, an affine open, that is the complement of a, of a hypersurface in Pn. And if also the projective hull is contained in there, then the projective hull is actually the polynomial hull with respect to omega um, of k. That is, you know, this complement of a variety can be embedded, embedded into, into a larger CN. And you take the you take the polynomial hull. You just use the regular functions on the on the, on the affine variety. Okay, so. Conjecture A is, suppose you have a compact regular real analytic curve, then the projective hull minus the curve should be a complex analytic curve. So this is the projective analog of rumors theorem, one in 58. And um, now of course this complex analytic curve may possibly be empty as it can be in rumors theorem. And it will follow if you have this, that, that the boundary of this will be a, uh, will be a certain number of components of gamma. Now, there's a point that you start thinking about this, that you might hope that each component of the projective hull minus, minus the curve <coughs> Uh, could be found to lie in some affine subvariety. In other words, it lies in the complement of some hypersurface. And then one could use Wormer's theorem with some, with some sophistication. And um, it turns out this is not true. So there was a, a, a theorem of Bruno Fabre, which uses Max Rosenlich's Jacobians of singular curves which is, I think, a PhD thesis written by Max Rosenlake here at Harvard, and Zariski. At any rate, Fabry's theorem says, suppose you have an irreducible algebraic curve, which is singular, and the singular set is non-trivial. <coughs> then there exists an open set in this curve with smooth boundary, such that U meets every divisor in Pn. So it's not contained in any in any affine open. So it's a little more, the problem's a little more complicated than one might think. Now, I wanna talk about something called stability. So given the compact subset of complex projective space, there's a function defined on the projective hull and it goes to R, not Rn, I'm sorry. Um, the best constant function. And it's given as follows, I mean, we know that if it's in the projective, if X is in the projective hull, then there's some C depending on X, such that this inequality, that inequality holds. And, um, and if it holds for one C, it holds for all C's that are greater, that's clear. And so you can take the inf and it actually holds to the inf. And that's called the best constant at the point X. Now, Definition is the K is stable is stable if this uh, best constant function is bounded above. Is bounded above, and so so Reese Harvey, John Wormer, and I were able to show that conjecture A holds if gamma is stable, and um, this uses deep insights of Eric Bishop from from way back. Um, now, 
Now, it's always um, nice when you find something that you like <coughs> to realize that it's related to other, other things in mathematics. And that's true here. And to explain how that goes. Oh, sorry, I wanted to do this first. <laughs> yes, so the projective hole is also related to a projective version of um, the Gelfand transform. So I want to now look at graded Banach algebra. So that's here what it is. Each of the A sub Ds are, um, are supposed to be Banach spaces and it's an algebra and satisfies the expected relations. So I'll just give you two examples. One is, suppose I have a holomorphic Hermitian line bundle lambda on an algebraic manifold X. Then I define A sub D to be the holomorphic sections of the dth power of that line bundle. And that will give you a Banach algebra, graded algebra. The second example is take uh, Hermitian line bundle on a compact Hausdorff space and look at the continuous sections of the dth power of that line bundle. <coughs> and then the direct sum of these gives you again a Bonnock, graded Banach algebra. And when x equals k equals a point, the Banach algebra is just the polynomial algebra in one variable. Okay. So so what's true is that given, given a Banach graded algebra, there exists a topological space, K sub A, which has a natural line bundle lambda, and there is a natural embedding of this Banach algebra, graded Banach algebra into the into example two. Okay. The K is this, is this space that comes up. So K sub A star is the sort of homogeneous spectrum of A, A star. And it's, this is in modern algebraic geometry, Groton Dieck's proj of a graded ring, right? It's very much like that. Okay, so, um, so now what's the relation to projective hull? So if I take a compact subset of Pn and I, I let the graded ring be the uh, restriction of the coordinate ring to K, then it turns out that the projective, the homogeneous um, spectrum is nothing but the projective hull of K. So this is the projective analog of, of what happens with Gelfand's theory for the polynomial hull, okay? So when you have this graded ring, then, then this, this space K sub A star, the homogeneous spectrum is, is exactly, well, it's again, naturally isomorphic to um, K to, to the polynomial hull. Okay, now it's always nice when um, you find out that what you're looking at is comes up elsewhere in mathematics, and, uh, and that's true here. So to explain this, I need to talk about something called quasi pluri subharmonic functions. It's a terrible name. Um, and uh, so I wanna start with a compact Kähler manifold, X Kähler form omega. Then the function is said to be quasi pluri subharmonic if it's upper semi-continuous, it's allowed to have a value minus infinity and it satisfies this inequality. Now this has to be satisfied in the sense of, of distributions, um, but just to start with, imagine that, that phi is C2 or C infinity, because I wanna point out that, that if you're on a compact complex manifold, and you don't have omega up there, you just have a pluri subharmonic function, then it's the pluri subharmonic function must be constant. But if you, if you change it by 
requiring that DDC of phi plus the omega plus the Kähler form is positive, then there are lots of them. And so, and so the potential theory that you, you know in CN carries over. Okay. Now, you can also talk about this um, locally um, without talking about DDC. Uh, locally, the Kähler form has a DDC potential. And this simply says that if you take phi direct phi plus the potential for the for the Kähler form locally, then that sum, when restricted to a holomorphic curve, is always subharmonic. So, and we don't use derivatives, right? Subharmonic is something that makes sense on a curve by being sub the harmonic function. Right? Okay, now given a compact set and a point not in it, you can define this, this function, namely you take the soup of all the Puri subharmonic functions on X, evaluated it, the point little X, and satisfy the inequality that they're less than or equal to zero on K. Okay, so, so Vincent Gedge and Ahmed Zeriahi proved that if X is equal to PN, then this function lambda sub K is the log of the best constant function C sub K. So the, the two functions are, if you're not on the, if you're not on the, um, on the projective hull, then both functions are equal to plus infinity. But on the projective hull, um, CK is e to the, to the lambda K. So you can use either one. Now, Gedge and Zeriahi proved many important things about lambda K relating to capacities and so forth. And, um, oh yeah, and this, you know, a lot of what they did um, extends to projective algebraic manifolds using the uh, work of Mayi. But um, one of the things that came out of this is the following, and that is in, in, in the affine case, Wormer's theorem started with real, anal real analyticity, but it wasn't necessary. However, in the projective case, real analyticity is necessary. If you have a, so it turns out from work of Gejin Zeriahi and, and examples of Diedrich Farnes and Levenberg, Martin and Pileski, that there exists a regular C infinity closed curve gamma in C2, uh, viewed as a subset of, of P2 in the usual way, such that the polynomial hull of this curve is a complex analytic curve with boundary gamma, but the projective hull is all of P2, all of P2. And what that means is that, is that this conjecture one doesn't work for C infinity curves. It doesn't work. <coughs> okay, now there are some analytic theorems which I go through. Um, that are useful in looking at these things. So the first one says for a compact set in PN, the following are equivalent. X is in the projective hull of K and the, the lambda function at X is less than or equal to a given constant lambda. So the lambda function is, is Bounded above, is bounded above by lambda. And the second item is that there exists a positive one one current and a probability measure mu on K such that DDC of T is equal to mu minus the delta function at X. And, um, and the support of T is contained in the closure of the projective hull. 
So again, k hat p of lambda is a set of points x where lambda lambda sub k is less than or equal to lambda at x. And dc here, I wanted to point out dc is, is not just d bar minus d, it's, it's this multiple of it. It makes all the formulas be much better. Okay, that kind of standard thing. And P11 are the positive currents of mass less than or equal to lambda. Okay, so this is supposed to be C, not Cn. So the closure of the projective hull minus K is one concave, which means no local peak points and their maps, holomorphic maps to C. But what I really want to say is that if you have um, a compact real analytic curve, then for a real analytic curve, the, um, and again, real analyticity is important, then the projective hull has Hausdorff dimension two. It has Hausdorff dimension two. Furthermore, if the closure of the projective hull has, Hausdorff, has finite Hausdorff two measure on an open set outside of gamma, then that intersection is a one-dimensional complex analytic variety of U. So these are things that make you think it should be true. <laughs> Much of this carries over to more generally. But now what I like to talk about is how this relates to something called projective linking. So I want to go from just looking at curves to looking at cycles, okay? So, so by a cycle, I mean the following. I, the gamma, gamma is now not necessarily dimension one. So <laughs> gamma is, is a finite sum nj gamma j, where the nj's are positive integers and where the union of the gamma j's is a compact embedded oriented real analytic manifold of dimension two P minus one in PN. So you have, your, you have a nice manifold with various components, compact real analytic dimension two P minus one, you give positive and it's oriented, you give positive integers to each component and that gives you a cycle dimension two P minus one. And I'll just call that a two P minus one cycle for short, okay? So that's what I mean by a 2p minus one cycle. So what is the projective linking number of this cycle, cycle um, with an algebraic cycle, which is positive in the complement? So I wanna take a, uh, an algebraic cycle of co-dimension p um, in the complement of this, of the support of this algebraic site of this, 2p minus one cycle. And then the link to gamma with this 2p minus, this n, n minus p cycle in the, in the complement is given by first taking the, 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 the intersection product. Oh, well, so what I wanna do is to take a rectifiable 2p current with the property that its boundary is gamma. So now I have something which is a 2p cycle and something which is a real 2n minus p cycle. So I can take their intersection product, okay? And then I wanna subtract off the degree of z times the integral of the pth power of the Kähler form over n. And there's something called the reduced projective linking number, which is just gotten by dividing by p factorial times the degree of z. And um, now I want to claim that, that this number is independent of the choice of this rectifiable 2p current with boundary gamma. In particular, if I have a second one, n prime, then by subtracting, by subtracting that the definition, the first definition, one from the other, you get this equation. And I'll come back to that in a minute. I want this equation to be zero, but I get the left-hand side of this equation. 
So what do I mean by the intersection pairing? Well, it's, it's a, a product of the 2P relative homology, Pn modulo the support of this cycle, across the 2N minus P homology, Pn minus the cycle into Z, and it's simply given by the intersection of cycles. I have something here with boundary on gamma, and I have something here which is, has no boundary and, and, and is complementary bended. Now, by intersection of cycles, I mean, you can actually just use transversality theory and in many cases that works. On the other hand, under Alexander duality, which I, <laughs> I forgot to change this, I forgot to change this to be Pn minus gamma. So Alexander duality says that this guy is equal to this guy where it's Pn minus gamma. And here the, 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 the intersection of cycle simply becomes the Kronecker pairing. So if I go back, if I look at this, N minus N prime is a cycle because they both have the same boundary. Okay, so I have a cycle of dimension 2p and a cycle of real dimension 2n minus p. I take their intersect, I take their inner product on the pn. So all that is is the degree of this cycle times the degree of that cycle. Now, on the other hand, if I take this cycle and, and take its inner product with this, what does that mean? Well, it means because it's the Kronecker pairing, it simply means the integral of omega to the p over this difference. And so that again gives me the degree of z times the degree of n minus n prime, which gives me zero. So it really didn't matter. Um, so, it, so this is well-defined basic point here. <laughs> okay, so now, uh, I haven't gotten to conjectures B, but I'm, let's assume it's true. Then, and let's let gamma be a 2p minus one cycle, real analytic cycle of dimension, real dimension 2p minus one. Then the following are equivalent. The first is the gamma is the boundary of a holomorphic p chain of mass less than or equal to a real number lambda. And the second is, that the, norm, that, the, that the reduced linking number of gamma with Z is greater than or equal to minus lambda for all positive algebraic subvarieties Z of codimension P in the complement of gamma. Okay. <coughs> so, so this is something that Reese and I have always liked a lot. Boundaries of uh, boundaries of holomorphic uh, holomorphic chains, and um, so here you have some. You know, we we actually worked in Stein manifolds, but but here you have something in 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 complex projective space, which is nice. I mean, it's it says that that linking linking numbers with algebraic cycles in the complement not only gives you the fact that you, if it satisfies this condition, this boundedness condition, not only gives you that the cycle, the 2p minus one cycle bounds a whole, a positive holomorphic p chain, but it, it actually gives you a bound on the mass. So what is conjecture B? Well, conjecture B is suppose you have a one cycle, a one cycle on the complex projective plane, which satisfies two above. So <clears throat> the linking numbers are bounded below. Then, then gamma bounds a positive holomorphic one chain. Actually, you could just say then gamma is stable and, and the rest will, will follow. Okay. Uh, so we're really assuming much more about the cycle here. I mean, it's, first of all, its dimension is much higher. And, um, 
And we're now saying something about the linking numbers being bounded. And we only really need to prove it for one cycles in P2. So, okay, now the same theorem holds in, in greater generality. So let's let X be a compact complex of submanifold of dimension N and let lambda be uh, just the restriction of the hyper of the uh, hyperplane bundle, the curvature of omega. And um, suppose I have a 2p minus one cycle gamma on this, and I'm going to assume that it's zero in homology. And then I can define the linking number in this way. I take the I take any rectifiable current n with boundary gamma, and um, I take the intersection product minus um, minus l times the integral of n over omega p, where l is the homology class. This cycle. I'm, I'm assuming that it, that this cycle um, has homology class l times omega p. I don't need them all. And then there's a reduced version of this and essentially the same theorem holds. Okay, essentially the same theorem holds. Okay, so, so when gamma is of dimension one, there are variants of the main hypothesis and I'll just, one of them is something that goes back to Wormer and Herb Alexander, it's a winding number. So if you have a section of the, of the dth power of the hyperplane bundle, um, which is positive one gamma, then the winding number is simply defined to be the integral over gamma of the co of the differential DC of log of the norm of, of, of sigma. Okay, and there's a reduced winding number. You just divide by the uh, by L. This is a section of a lambda to the lth power. Now there's something called the Poincaré lemma, which says that if you take DDC, the log of, of the log of the norm of, of this sigma. It has two components. One is the divisor of sigma, and the other is minus L times the, the Kähler form. What a wonderful theorem in complex analysis, right? So, um, and, but if you apply this to the definitions, it says precisely that the winding number is equal, the winding, the, the reduced winding number is the same thing as the reduced linking number. And, um, but this is, comes about because of the Poincaré lemma. Another equivalent condition is that for all Fourier subharmonic functions on X, the integral over gamma of DCU is bigger than or equal to minus lambda. So, uh, I mean, here, because they're the same. Well, anyway. All right, so, so I want to finish with really discussing the um, question of boundaries of varieties in projective space and, other, and projective manifolds. So let's let X be a compact projective manifold of dimension N and let M be a compact real analytic manifold of real dimension 2P minus one, okay? Then again, we have this intersection product of two P cycles with two N minus P cycles. Okay. And, um, and we can look at the following. We can look at the classes in relative homology H2P of X comma M, which are represented by positive algebra, positive holomorphic cycles. Okay, but these are cycles which could have boundary on M. And, um, 
And there's also, I'm going to let P n minus P be this subset of, of the two n minus P homology of X minus M, which are represented by positive algebraic cycles. Okay, so these are simply the guys that carry analytic, complex analytic cycles, if you like, positive. Then, then if you assume conjecture B, the following is true. Um, now I'm saying here that the Hodge conjecture holds on X. I mean something a little bit stronger than the Hodge conjecture, I'll show you that in a moment. Just forget this and just assume that X is say a Grossman manifold, a projective space or a Grossman manifold. Okay, then the following is true, that P sub P, that is those classes that, are rep that contain positive analytic chains with boundary on, on M is the polar of the set of algebraic cycles in the complement of M. By the polar, I mean that the guys here are exactly the linear functionals under the, or exactly the, the, the set of cohomology classes under this pairing, <coughs> the intersection pairing, for which, the, for which the pairing is greater than or equal to zero for everything in P n minus P, right? That's the polar of a cone. So this is really sort of very nice. I mean, um, and there is a, a slightly more general version of this. Um, so you've, let's fix a class in the relative group H two P of X comma N. We let's assume D D is not equal to zero. Uh, so its boundary is not zero and H two P minus one of M. And then if the intersection pairing of tau with eta is positive for all those cohomology classes, which contain positive algebraic cycles in the complement of M. In other words, tau is in the polar of P n minus P X minus N. Then there exists a positive holomorphic P chain T on X such that DT is equal to D tau, the thing we started with. So you have something that has, you have something that has this, this boundary. Furthermore, if you take tau and subtract off the cohomology class of T, this cohomology class is represented by a positive PP current. And if it's represented by a positive PP current in projective space, then it's represented by an algebraic cycle, same for Grossman manifolds. And what I mean by the Hodge conjecture, if, it's, if any homology class which contains a positive PP, any integer homology class, which contains a positive PP current is, is represented by an analytic cycle. And then you get this. Of course, that's very, very far from, from the Hodge conjecture, but it's for lots of nice manifolds, it's true. And so this gives you a very nice theorem about sort of projective linkings and intersection products and so forth that are all true if you assume conjecture B. And um, so it would be really nice if someone could prove it. <laughs> That's all I have to say, thank you. <laughs>